Well, you can take your seat belts off. We're going to calm down now a little bit. <laughs> Isn't he something? Yeah. And I need the toy. Here we are. Well, what I'd like to do is to start where Bruce left off. Oh, by the way, just uh, it occurred to me when uh, I was being introduced about the 14 years in, in the business world, and, and Doug said, well, something made him transition. I can tell you it was living in fear for 14 years. <laughs> it was living in protection. I don't know if you spend any time in the corporate world, but there's a tendency to uh, circle the wagons and, uh, and hope it's, uh, you're going to be safe. So I had done my time there. I saw a lot of pain. I saw a lot of opportunity, but in the position I was in, I couldn't do much with it. And so I really felt in the midst of really having everything that uh, you're supposed to want. Uh, good job, uh, big bucks, uh, all the creature comforts you could ask for, but what I noticed was my soul was hurting. I wasn't okay there. I wasn't okay just getting paid to do something I really didn't want to do and to sell something I didn't care about. So that was a crisis in a sense for me, but it was a real uh, spiritual emergence as well. It was a coming out. It was a, a, a time to choose. Did I want to do my heart's desire or did I just want to fold into the, uh, the norm and do what, what I was expected to do? And I made the change. And 14 years later, I can highly recommend doing it. It's, uh, it's challenging at the time, especially uh, when I did it and the way I did it, because I walked away from a very high paying job and it was a very good job by all people's standards, but it, uh, it wasn't feeding the right part of me. So I'm here tonight and I'm really grateful to Doug and to Bruce for the opportunity to share with you some of the things I've discovered over the last 14 years uh, about the nature of change and about the nature of beliefs and their effect on our lives. So let's get going. I want to start with Bruce's conclusions plus one that I added to the list. Do you remember his slide that said perception controls behavior? Very powerful words coming especially from a biologist. Perception controls the genes. Perception rewrites genes. And where I'm going with this is perception also rewrites behavior. I expect there's just uh, two or three of you in the room maybe that might have a few behaviors you'd like to rewrite. Uh, I certainly did, especially 14 years ago. And so my search was to find the easiest, uh, sanest, most effective, and quite frankly, the, the most painless way to do it. Uh, graduate school didn't teach me about the painless part. In fact, it was all about go back, find the pain, work through the pain, and that's the only way to change your beliefs. Uh, I do have a different story to tell you at this point, uh, quite, a, quite a lot different than that schooling. The thing about perception, because Bruce used the word a lot and then he squeezed it together with the word uh, belief, I'd like to make a little bit of a distinction there for us uh, this evening. Perception, in my opinion, is awareness. The dictionary calls it awareness, but it's shaped by belief. Belief actually precedes perception. And I'm going to be talking about how that happens, but the important fact about it is that beliefs control your perceptions. If you rewrite the beliefs, you can rewrite perception. And if you rewrite the perception, you can rewrite the genes and the behavior. So there really is no distinction, if you're in the healing arts, especially the complementary ones, between mind and body. It's just a dif different expression of us, who we are. I want to define beliefs as a working definition anyway in the following way. Beliefs are conclusions derived from experience, and, uh, information and or experience. They can be either conscious or subconscious. And what I mean by this, let me give you an example. Beliefs uh, derived by conclusions from information would be the kind of thing that would happen if you got jury duty and you weren't at the event that's being tried, let's say it's a criminal case, you weren't there present when the so-called crime was committed, but you're sitting in a jury situation. You're now required to listen to information from two attorneys telling you their story, getting you ultimately to come to some truth, some level of belief about what happened in that event you couldn't attend. So you're creating a belief through information alone. The second version of that is experience. Uh, typical experience is say you're two years old, imagine, and you've never experienced uh, fire before. So you're crawling around and there's a candle left on and you're getting curious because you haven't had an experience with a candle or fire yet. So as uh, most kids that are two years old, they'll move towards anything they don't understand to discover what it is. 
So you move closer and closer to that candle, and isn't it interesting? So you stick your little hand out, like you do with everything else, to touch it and grab it and see what it is like, and sure enough, you get burned. Well, as soon as you get burned, you've had an experience. Now it's not just curiosity that's associated with that candle. There's an experience and a conclusion that is drawn from touching that fire, which turns into a belief, which ultimately, as I'll, as I'll show you, affects your future perception of candle. In the beginning, there's not much... Uh, uh, of a uh, differentiated perception, but in, after an experience like that, there certainly is. And then the, uh, I'm going to talk a lot more about the conscious and subconscious mind, because this is where, in my opinion, the greatest amount of ignorance exists in mainstream psychotherapy, is that we've been trying to work, uh, trying to change subconscious beliefs uh, with lots of conscious means. And it turns out the two minds are so different that it's no wonder it doesn't work very well. Your beliefs actually determine your biological and behavioral reality. If I had to, to just describe Bruce's presentation in total in one statement, this would be it. Virtually every part of our lives is governed by our belief systems. And we'll talk about that a little more too. Do you remember this slide? Here's the filter representing our belief systems. And if you look at it from this point of view, it's really a powerful thing to witness. Beliefs are really the filters of reality. You don't see the world as it is. You see the world as you are. In fact, you can't not do that. It's the most interesting thing is that each of you sitting out there looking at this presentation are actually having a very different experience of it. You all have the illusion it's the same experience. You'll talk about having been here, but it's not the same experience for you at all. Your set of filters about who I am, what I'm saying, where this place is, how you're feeling right now, that all profoundly affects your experience of this evening. So you think, well, it was a fact. Here's what happened. But then you start talking to your friend that you came with or someone else that attended this particular uh, event. They had a very different experience. So it's always that way. And if you can remember that, as soon as you're thinking, well, I've got the facts straight about something, remember, the facts are your subjective opinion, your filters of reality. And that's what, that's what perceptions are all about. That's what really matters here. Beliefs create perceptions, and they affect virtually every area of your life, as I mentioned. Self-esteem, for instance. I mean, your perceptions either define you as worthy or worthless in relationships, either loved or or unloved. Uh, with respect to prosperity, that's a pretty popular one. You either can attract money easily in, in your life or your perception is it's hard to get and hard to keep and you'd mismanage it anyway. Uh, you look at your job performance. If your perception of yourself is, as a competent person or an incompetent person, it's going to make a heck of a lot of difference in terms of how you perform your job and also the perception of others, of course. Mental health, you can see yourself as generally a happy person or a depressed one. Physical health, I mean, Bruce's presentation makes that pretty clear. The psychology profoundly impacts the biology of the body. Spiritual outlook, we have so many different spiritual systems and ways of looking at the hologram of God, so to speak, and all of the facets of it that uh, it is about perception when we're looking that causes us to, uh, to believe and act in the way we do. And, of course, the list goes on and on. You remember this slide? This is our friend Ecstasy. She represents joy. She represents growth in Bruce's model, moving towards something that's pleasurable. Do you remember this one? The scream, it's called. So this one, of course, represents protection and fear. So my question to you is, if you had a choice, if you could choose between Living like this, having your life and the undertone of your life being this feeling that you get when you look at this, or this, which would you choose? Oh no, let's review again. <laughs> it's a tough choice. Would it be her? Or would it be him? All right, if you're having any trouble uh, uh, deciding here, or if you've decided you'd prefer this one, I only have one recommendation. See your doctor immediately and get your medication adjusted. <laughs> because under normal conditions, people are going to pick her. We want uh, consciously to have our lives work. We want the life, our lives to be filled with joy and pleasure and to look forward to each day. What prevents us from doing that? What is really the bottom line cause? How, do we, how, it is, how is it that your life maybe doesn't represent as much of this ecstasy as you'd like to it? 
have it represent right now. And I'll propose to you that what Bruce was telling you was absolute truth, and I'm just going to add a little bit to it. Whether you're living in growth and protection makes all the difference in the world. What determines that? Well, I can messages as a child versus I can't messages are one of the big ways that that determination happens. If you receive more positive input from your environment, generally your parents, for instance, and you were told that you were lovable, you were told that you could accomplish anything, you were told you were good enough, you were told that you were wonderful, then you're probably having a life that reflects that more now than anybody could imagine versus if you were told more I can't messages. You're not good enough, you'll never amount to anything, you're not smart enough, all those things that's, that many of us heard. Those go in just like experiences. Those are experiences. They're just information driven. They're parentally induced, usually reinforced by society. And so we end up with a series of experiences that either put us primarily in growth or protection from our perception of life. Turns out our childhood programming becomes our habits of perception and behavior. You get your programs early on. By about five years old, the psychologist will tell you, your personality is pretty well set. What they mean by that is, you've had enough experiences to draw conclusions about yourself, and now you're either lo looking at yourself through the growth or protection filters. The good news is, even if you have produced these filters and you have habits that are supporting the perceptions and the behaviors that you don't want, they are changeable. They are changeable. Habits are usually the things that bug us the most because, most because they are... They are what they are. Habits are things that happen out of your conscious awareness. It doesn't seem like you have any control over them. You consciously try to control the habit. You say you're not going to do something, but you do it anyway. So I want to explain to you how the cycle of habituation occurs, why it occurs, and then ultimately how you can break that cycle. These cycles are really self-reinforcing, and let me see if I can explain this to you. I'm going to use the candle as a model because we talked about that earlier. If you're two years old and you're having your first encounter with fire and it happens to be connected to a candle and you crawl over to this fire and it's a very interesting thing. You've not formed any opinions about candles or fire yet because you've never touched anything that was hot and now you do for the first time. All of a sudden you've got an experience. The experience is hurt. Ouch. That shapes the perception. The candle's no longer a general thing. Now it's a thing that could create pain. You have a perception of the candle. The perception creates a belief that candles are dangerous, or at least fire is dangerous. You've got it connected to the candle, but the main thing is the fire. That perception then shapes your experience of this candle. The experience reinforces the beliefs. What happens is, the next time you see a candle, instead of crawling over to it and sticking your hand in the candle, your perception of the candle as a possible source of pain keeps you from doing that. The fact that you're not going to go over there and stick your hand in that in that candle again, it, you'll never again have the same nebulous sort of perception. You're going to have a very specific perception of candles and you're going to watch out for it. Now whether as a child you learned about hot from sticking your hand in the fire and you got burned that way, or as you get older you have more complex experiences, you get burned in other ways. You get burned in relationships as they say. That's a very complex form of burn, but it's a burn nevertheless. And it usually leaves a mark so that when you, next time when you look at that situation, whether it's a relationship or whatever it was where you got hurt, you're going to move away from that. You're going to move into protection. And it's a self-reinforcing cycle. So some of the good cycles, like learning that fire is hot and to keep your hand out of it, is wonderful. You don't want to interrupt those cycles. But what about the cycles of self-deprecation? What about the cycles that say you're not good enough? What about the cycles that aren't very generative, that you'd like to get rid of? Then it would be important to be able to break the cycles. Basically, breaking the cycle amounts to rewriting the software of your mind, because then you can change the printout of your experience. As Bruce said so eloquently, it's about your perception. If you can change how you perceive the environment, essentially how you can perceive yourself in the environment, you can change the environment. You'll be treated differently the second you treat yourself differently. We're told that, you know, day in and day out by all the positive thinkers, but they stop at that part. And then what do you do? Well, there is a something you can do, but how do you do it? It requires two things, really, information and tools. I'm going to give you a little bit more information, and then we'll get to the tool part. And please understand that with respect to the tools and the confines of my situation tonight, which is one hour, not two days in a workshop, I'll be able to hopefully demonstrate at least one of the Psyche 
change processes that I've developed over the years uh, so that you can get an idea of how quickly uh, a belief you may have had all of your life actually can change and how you can verify that it's different uh, as, as soon as it changes. So we'll be doing both things. Now one of the key pieces of information you need to be aware of that makes all the difference in the world is that you don't have one mind, you have two. I mean, haven't you ever tried to change your mind only to find out your mind is a mind of its own? <laughs> bet you have. And I'll bet you, you relate to some of these things down here, the ways in which people try to do that. If you've ever promised yourself you'd get in shape, but then you didn't. Ever made a New Year's resolution you didn't keep? Ever tried to quit smoking? Try to stop procrastinating. That's a favorite one. You swore you'd never get involved with another relationship, but you do. And the list goes on, and you can fill in your favorite personal one down there about what you've tried to change, and you said you wanted to change it, so there's a conscious intention, a commitment. You're a bright, energetic, committed person, but somehow it just doesn't come off. It doesn't happen, even with your intention focused in that direction. Let me give you a little rundown on how different those two minds are, because this is very important in understanding the nature of how change can take place very quickly and why it's been so difficult with the tools we've been given for the past 35 years, which are mostly positive thinking, affirmations, willpower, that sort of thing. I don't know about you, I tried them all. You know, they worked maybe 20% of the time, very frustrating, but it was best we had at the time, so people kept doing it. Just say your affirmations, just do that meditation, just do it over and over and over again. The problem was, it's, it turns out, we were mostly talking to the wrong part of the mind that's in charge of habits, in charge of the change. Look, conscious mind, it's volitional. It sets goals, judges results, and it likes to try new things. That's the one that says, hey, there's something good happening, let's go out and do it. Let's go into an environment we've never been in. Let's ride the killer roller coaster. <laughs> let's do a bungee jump, you know? It's the one that would say, hey, that's a great idea. But your subconscious mind didn't like that at all. Subconscious mind says, it's busy monitoring the operations of your body, basic things like motor functions, heart rate, digestion, and it prefers the familiar. It's the part of you that likes to play it safe. It wants to know what's going to happen in the next moment. It doesn't want something new to contend with. Its basic job is to keep you alive and safe. So why would it want to bungee jump or get on a roller coaster? It's not interested in that. So remember, volitional, and habitual. Two different components of you completely. The conscious mind thinks abstractly. It's conceptually based. The subconscious mind thinks literally. It sees the world through your five senses. Bruce mentioned the five senses. You're going to see, hear, feel, taste, and smell. That's the only way the subconscious mind can know reality. The conscious mind is the one that reads all those self-help books. It's the one that says, yeah, aren't we inspired? Let's go for it. It's got all of that energy about uh, what you're going to do. It thinks up all those really great ideas. But without communicating the ideas to the subconscious mind uh, adequately, you usually don't go anywhere. You get very excited. You ever been to motivational speeches? I mean, just plain, flat motivational speeches. I mean, when I was in the corporate world, boy, we just did a lot of those. And I'd go into those things, and they'd just whip you into a frenzy. I was clapping and stomping and yelling and screaming, and I was so happy. And then as soon as that motivational speaker left, so did the motivation. If you didn't get him or her to come back, which is the point of it, of course, <laughs> to come back and get that fixed, you'd get cranked up again. But there's a better way to do that. There's a better way to get to that place and to stay there, and it has nothing to do with motivation, actually. The conscious mind is responsible for short-term memory, the subconscious mind for long-term memory. Now, the short-term memory has a little trick to it. I don't know if you know this, but it's an interesting fact. The average length of short-term memory in human beings is about 20 seconds long, short-term memory. Now, I thought that was really interesting because do you know how long it takes to look a phone number up in a phone book, take the coins out of your purse or pocket, and get them into a machine and dial that? 25 seconds. God's little trick. Yeah. So you can't quite pull that off in short-term memory. The subconscious mind is a very important uh, aspect of this change process that I'm going to be sharing with you because it is responsible for long-term memory, a critical element. If you get up in the morning and you've forgotten basic things that you learned when you were a child, oh, like, say, walking, you know, things like that, uh, driving as an adult, you'd have to relearn everything every morning when you got up. So you don't have to do that, and you can thank your subconscious mind because it remembers all of those things. It's taken all of that conscious learning and turned it into habitual understanding. Think about driving for a minute. You know, when you first learned how to drive a car, 
How many learned on a stick shift? I'm just curious. Are you old enough to have? Okay. Yeah, well, me too. And it was a nightmare. I don't know about you, but I'm sitting in, the, in this little car, and I've got a, a gear shift over here. It was on the column. That's how old I am. It was on a column shift, and I got two feet, but there are three pedals. I'm thinking bad engineering right away. You know, it's a problem. What am I going to do with those? Then you've got mirrors. You've got people coming this way, people behind you. You've got to steer the darn thing. You've got a clutch, accelerator, brake. I mean, it was completely overwhelming, not counting my father, who was sitting next to me, yelling at me the whole time because he wanted to save his transmission in that car. And I'm popping the clutch, and it was an awful experience. But eventually, having survived it, I was able to move into an automatic version of driving, and now I don't think about it at all. In fact, most people don't think about driving at all. I noticed since I got here, anyway. <laughs> this is a very interesting place. <laughs> But you know, the beauty of it is you can have a conversation on the way from point A to point B. You don't remember driving at all. You had a great conversation, but somehow you get there. What's that about? I mean, who's paying attention? Fortunately, you have a very powerful part of you that is paying attention. That's your subconscious mind. That gets you around when you're doing the things that are really fun, and it takes care of most of these baseline things that uh, would uh, consume all our time if we had to do them consciously. All right, the conscious mind is time-bound which means it's past and future based. And for most conscious minds, if you're living with the scream uh, mentality, you spend most of your time regretting your past and agonizing over the future. So that's not very much fun. Your subconscious mind is timeless, however. It thinks in the proverbial present moment only. So when you're talking to the subconscious mind, this fact is very important. It doesn't understand future tense requests. If you put your request, uh, what you want, in a future tense for the subconscious, it mostly yawns and goes back to digesting your dinner because he doesn't get it. So you have to talk present tense. Now, that seems a little crazy from your conscious mind's point of view because it's thinking, well, that hadn't happened yet. If I'm making up this statement that I want to be true, shouldn't I say I want it to be true? Only if you're trying to convince your conscious mind. So there's some rules about how you address and communicate with the subconscious that are very important to making it all work. Another difference, very important one, the conscious mind is, has limited processing capacity, maybe one to three events it can handle at a time. If you're uh, at home and the phone rings and you're watching a TV program and somebody walks in uh, from the, the, the kitchen and they want to talk to you, uh, about that time when those three things are going on, you're saying, wait a minute, one thing at a time, well, you know, I've got to stop now. Because you really can't process. It only is processing at about a rate of 2,000 bits of information per second, which sounds wonderful and, and, and kind of awesome in its own way, unless you compare it to the subconscious mind, who has expanded processing capacity, can process thousands of events at a time, and averages 4 billion bits of processing capacity in a, in a given second. That's, that's an incredible difference. But if you think about it, this part of your mind would have to do that. Remember, it's in charge of motor functions. You can't walk, talk, digest your food, do respiration, digestion, or any of that without a huge amount of processing capacity. You couldn't sit up in your chairs. Because what you take for granted, you just say, well, I'm going to do that. You turn on your volition part, which is your conscious mind, and say, let's walk from here to there. But you know, you can't walk from here to there consciously. If your subconscious mind doesn't agree, you aren't going anywhere. And that's true of your beliefs changing, too. And we're getting to that. All right. It's easy to change habits of thought and behavior if you access the subconscious mind because it's the storehouse for attitudes, values, and beliefs. This is where doing your basic affirmations every day, which are generally so abstract that the subconscious mind can't understand it. It really doesn't care what you're trying to do because you haven't engaged it in any way, shape, or form. And you're talking to the wrong part of the mind in the first place. The subconscious mind is where all these attitudes, values, and beliefs are stored. So if you don't learn how to communicate with it properly, you aren't going to get very far. You're going to be very frustrated. And that's exactly what I was. <laughs> that's why I'm sharing with you these, uh, a, a whole different approach. All right, so as um, the, the, the easiest and most effective way to communicate with the subconscious is, is through a process called muscle testing. And I'll bet you a bunch of you in this room have had some experience with muscle testing. Is that true? Can I see a show of hands? All right. So I'm going to ask you temporarily during this, this uh, discussion and also an experience that I'd like you to have to forget everything you know about it right now. Pretend you don't have any preconceived notions about it. Humor me. There's some things that are very important about using muscle testing in a psychological way that are very different 
from using it in almost every other way. Vitamin mineral supplements, it's very popular in applied kinesiology, clinical kinesiology, looking for organ distress, meridian dysfunctions, and so on. I'm not going to be talking about any of that, but I'm going to be talking about some key elements to using it as an accurate measure of what's going on in your subconscious mind, what those beliefs are and what they're not. Okay. I'm going to have a little experience, and I'm going to ask uh, someone to help me up here to demonstrate uh, muscle testing a la Psyche. Psyche is the name, of the, uh, the name I give the work that I do. And I want to show you when I'm using it as a psychological tool to access the subconscious and check for beliefs, uh, how to set up an appropriate communication system. And the key here is, is, is appropriate. You want to get a true false uh, message system going, in other words, a conflict detector, the truth. You're measuring the truth between what, you, what your conscious mind says or is affirming and what your subconscious mind believes. Very important to be able to do that credibly. Like dislike is essentially equivalent to a stress detector. Uh, I learned this one uh, to use uh, muscle testing in this way. Uh, when I got out of graduate school, I was doing sort of mainstream counseling. That's the insight-based talk therapy version where you come in and we sit down together and you tell me all your woes and I nod and say, yeah, that's interesting, tell me more about that. And you do. And then you come back next week and you tell me more about that. And come back next week and you tell me more about that. Well, I got tired of hearing it, they got tired of talking about it, so I figured something's got to change here. And a part of me, which was really the business part, uh, just said, wait a minute, there's got to be some kind of outcome here. I mean, business is all about outcomes, all about bottom line. Turns out therapy, as I was taught in graduate, graduate school, is all about process. You just stay in the process. It's good for you. Oh, where's the part where you get out and get a life? I mean, you know, <laughs> when does it end? Well, apparently it wasn't supposed to end. I never got that. So I thought, well, that's not right. So we're going to do something about that. So in the like-dislike thing, what, what I found was interesting was I'd get people coming in. They'd fill out this intake form. And uh, I'd always ask, have you, have you had any other kind of counseling? And they're, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're putting it down there, 15 years of psychotherapy and all that. <laughs> That's no joke. And they would say, I'd say, okay. So, uh, and they're writing down what their primary uh, presenting problem is, what, what they're trying to deal with. And they just write down stuff about, I said, what, what about your childhood? Tell me about your relationship between your mother and a father, you know. So, so I remember this one client wrote down, yeah, well, I've dealt with my mother, you know, she was very abusive uh, psychologically and physically, and, uh, but you know, I've dealt with that and I'm over it. And I said, oh, that's good. So uh, we, we got to the muscle testing part and I just had her, had her stick her arm out and I was going to do a little muscle test, a stress, stress detector uh, style. And I said, think about your mother. So she did. <laughs> and guess what happened? <laughs> she just crashed and burned. I mean, she was, she was a mess. The muscle response was very clear that just thinking about her mother still stressed her. All of those years of psychotherapy, all of those years of putting together reasons why I've now forgiven my mother, never got to the subconscious mind, which controls the motor functions, which controls the autonomic nervous system, which controls your biology, and ultimately your health. You know, Bruce mentioned, do you remember about the biology and the effect on our immune systems? There are a whole set of beliefs that are immune enhancing beliefs and a whole set of beliefs that are immune suppressing beliefs. And if you look at the personality profiles of people who get various diseases, it becomes very interesting in a hurry. There's a whole field called psychoneuroimmunology, about 35 years of study in this country anyway, showing that people, for instance, cancer patients, one of the key um, qualities and attributes, uh, personality characteristics of cancer patients is long repressed anger and hatred. They're really angry at somebody else, but if you hold that anger inside you, guess where it gets directed? It's your immune system. So the question is, how do you let go of stuff like that? We're going to be getting to that. So third down here is setting up a yes or no communication system because in this work that I do, it's essential that you can communicate with the subconscious in a way to ask it questions and let it determine even what process is going to be used within this model of psyche that I use. There are a variety of belief change processes just as there would be if I was a carpenter and I had my little bag of tools. I'd have a pair of pliers and a screwdriver and a hammer at the very least. Because otherwise, if you just handed a hammer and you said, go build that house, well, you better find a lot of nails because that's all you're going to be able to deal with. So you need some way to communicate uh, yes or no, um, get yes or no communication from the subconscious. The, the last little note here, and I'll, I'll demonstrate this in just a second with someone, is where you position your eyes when you're muscle testing for psychological responses matters, as it turns out. Uh, and I'll show you. I'll demonstrate that for you. Uh, I learned this through, uh, actually, this little piece of it through studying NLP years ago. They had made a big deal out of where your eyes are focused in terms of how you're processing 
uh, in your brain. And what I found out when I first uh, was introduced to muscle testing as a means of communication it was that sometimes it seemed to answer correctly and sometimes the answers were really bogus and I couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. And I finally pieced the mystery together and I figured out, wait a minute, sometimes people are saying things, they're having no emotional response to it all. Your arm doesn't operate automatically, it doesn't go strong or weak for no particular reason. If you're not having a response to it internally, then the electrical signal sent from your brain to the muscle has no effect. So used properly, uh, it, it will work fine. The other possibilities, and I, I don't have time to discuss them right now in terms of the anomalies, sometimes people will test weak to everything. There's a specific reason for that, and it turns out that's an easy correction. Sometimes they'll test strong to everything, no matter where their eyes are looking. And if you're strong to everything, that's another condition in the body that's happening at the time, and there's a corrective procedure for that. Because consciously, you walk around thinking you're in control of your body and your behaviors and your responses and all of that, and the fact is, mostly you're not. Most of you have your subconscious mind running the program, both, both behaviorally and biologically, and you're just not used to accessing it and experiencing it consciously. So muscle testing is a simple way to do that. So, on we go. Not only do you have two minds, you have two hemispheres of the brain. And this is one of the key pieces also associated with the change process. Uh, and I'm going to give you just a quick course, uh, Hemispheres 101 here, so we can move along. Most of you are familiar with the basic concept of uh, brain dominance theory. You have a left brain and a right brain, a left hemisphere and right hemisphere. The left side of your brain is really the primary center for logic, linear thinking. Uh, it's the primary speech center, so uh, that's where your words come from. It tends to be uh, analytical. It breaks things down into parts rather than putting them together. And it just loves the order and control of things. That's the part of you that thinks it's really good to get to work on time and to get your jobs done on time and can balance your checkbook and all those things that are a function of you know, ordinary life. So it's a good thing we have that hemisphere. But it's not the hemisphere where you have much fun, I notice. So you want to, you want to take into consideration the right brain, the right hemisphere. It's where your emotions are, it's where uh, pictures are made in your head instead of uh, words. It tends to synthesize rather than analyze, so it puts things together uh, rather than breaks them apart. And it tends to be the one that enjoys that feeling of being spontaneous and free. So when the weather's great and you could go do something really fun, that's the part that argues let's go, and the other side says no, we've got to get our work done first. So uh, sometimes they compete, in fact, almost always, uh, for your attention and control of your system, by the way. The arrows down at the bottom uh, represent this, this crossover relationship uh, between the, the hemispheres of the brain and the side of the body that, uh, that they control. For instance, the left hemisphere of the brain controls motor functions on the right side of the body and vice versa. The right hemisphere controls them on the left. Now, there's a, a word down at the bottom, or two words down at the bottom. Corpus callosum is a bundle of nerve fibers. They're like Think of them as fiber optic links, millions of them, part of a, a very sophisticated commissure system that uh, is a communication pathway between the left and the right hemisphere. On a good day, uh, when both hemispheres are talking to each other, uh, you're getting a lot of crosstalk going, that communication system is wide open. So you're, it's really a bridge between the hemispheres. And when things aren't going so well or you get stressed, as Bruce was talking about, the fight or flight response, what typically happens here is that that commissure system, that uh, corpus callosum, uh, shuts down like it becomes a, a barricade rather than a bridge to crosstalk. And so you will go into a favored hemisphere uh, to deal with a given situation. It's not that people are all left brain or right brain. The research uh, was very clear about that, but the pop culture didn't, didn't get that part. It's much easier to write about, oh, what are you, left brain or right brain? Well, guess what? You've got two hemispheres and you're both. The issue is, in a given situation, if you learn to over-identify with the qualities and attributes of one hemisphere versus the other, you will do that habitually until that's changed. The ideal circumstance, obviously, is to have both hemispheres working all the time, to be in a state I call the whole brain state, because then you have all the qualities and attributes available to deal with almost any situation. You don't automatically go into protection in a situation unless it's warranted, and then you can go there, because sometimes fight or flight's a good thing. You know, you, you got to get out of there, get the blood out of the viscera, get it to the limbs, and get out of dodge. So it's, it's all right to have that happen, but you want to be able to control it. You want to be able to perceive your reality through both hemispheres at the same time. And this little tidbit will come up in a little while, so I just wanted you to have a, a working um, reminder about it. The other thing is, the mind is not the brain. 
This is a very important concept. Bruce alludes to it all the time because he talks about it's about energy. I mean, in the final analysis, the physicists tell us it's all energy. So you've got a whole bunch of people here and here are complementary uh, healers, and you say, well, well, do you do energy work? <sighs> Show me something that isn't energy work. Allopathic medicine is energy work. What do you think the pills are? It's all molecules vibrating at some frequency. You're just ingesting them or injecting them or doing something, but it's all energy work in that sense. You can't not do energy work. Everything's energy. So remember that mind can really be described more aptly uh, than, than calling it the brain as photons of light held in an electromagnetic field. We're talking about moving energy here. That's what healing's about. That's what change is about. That's what the mind is about. The brain is the gray matter inside your cranium. It's like a, a, the CPU chip in a computer. It's the physical thing that you can crack open your cranium and you've got this thing in there, but that's not the mind. That's just the brain. That's a different deal altogether. It may be the central processing unit, the place where the uh, energy patterns interpenetrate, but you know it's not even limited to the brain. Those of you who know about the energy field in general know that mind is not a function of just a connection to the brain part. There's some really important, long-standing myths about change that I need to address before I demonstrate what I want to show you. And that is myth number one. If you've had a limiting belief for a long time, it'll take a long time to change it. Boy, that's a common one. I got so many people say, oh, it's so deeply embedded, Rob. You know, I've had this belief for 35 years, and it's just ingrained. And use all these anthropomorphic terms about how deeply it's embedded in your brain. You know, well, how deep could it be? You know, it's how many centimeters in there? You could get your finger in there and get one of the deepest ones. It's not like it's miles deep. What's that about? But we keep characterizing it in a way that makes belief change difficult. If you look at the reality of it, if it's photons of light held in an electromagnetic field, that's a different story. It isn't about deep. Ugh. All right. Anyway, most of the time, changing subconscious beliefs is more like changing a document in a computer. The computer is photons of light held in an electromagnetic field. It's an energy phenomenon. You can't go into your computer and dig in there. How deep can you get into the hard drive? I mean, it's a little chip. It's the same concept, and we've really made it hard. It doesn't take any longer to change a document that's been in there for 30 years as it does 30 and it's been in there for 30 minutes. And that's mostly true with belief systems people have carried around for years and years. I've just watched this happen in private practice over and over again, and in the classes I teach, people will say, oh, I've had this belief for 50 years. I mean, it's just remarkable, just remarkable. I had one, one quick story about that. A psychiatrist is using a psyche in Denver. He had taken the classes, and he had one of his patients was agoraphobic. You're familiar with agoraphobia? It's a fear of being out in the marketplace and open places and so on. She, this, she'd had this agoraphobia since she was about, uh, well, since she was a teenager because uh, she'd had it for over 50 years, and she was 60-plus years old. And it turns out it was an event that occurred in the eastern plains of Colorado. Her mother had taken her on a trip, and, and she was misbehaving. And so the mom said, you know, if you don't get your act together pretty soon, you're going to get out of the car, and I'm leaving you. You know, well, today we'd be all traumatized by that, but back in those days, that was what, <laughs> that's what your parents did. That's how they stayed in control. So the woman actually did stop the car because the kid kept misbehaving, put the child out, and she drove down the road. Well, not very far, but far enough to scare this little kid. And so she comes back, picks up the girl, the girl's in tears, piles her in the car, and they take off. Well, didn't take long before the little girl started to show these signs of fear of going out into open places. There are many places that are quite as open as the eastern plains of Colorado. I mean, it's a flat, desert-looking place. So she had this association with this place and with this fear, and nothing they had done. They tried drugs, they tried all kinds of therapies of various kinds, and this guy, had just this psychiatrist, had just taken this IK class, uh, a weekend class, the one I'm teaching this weekend, as a matter of fact, and, uh, and so he, uh, he, he got to a place with her, he just said, look, I've tried everything else, I, I gotta admit, I just went to this weekend workshop, I don't know if this will work or not, if it has anything to do with it, so he didn't really believe in it, and then she didn't believe in it, because she said, well, how can something like this affect a biochemical disorder, I mean, how can it work? And they both said, well, what the heck, you know, we'll just give it a shot. They did. And that one session, that, that agoraphobia disappeared. That woman was out driving a car within a week, going wherever she wanted. She had relatives she hadn't seen in the area unless they came to her house because she couldn't leave her house for all of those years. So it was just, I mean, that was a wonderful story and an amazing testimonial to the fact that I don't care how long you've had something, boils down to photons of light held in an electromagnetic field, and if you can find the address of that belief and you can rewrite that software, you can change the outcome. So keep that in mind when you're saying, oh, I've had that for a long time, that'll be a tough one. 
Not necessarily. Myth number two, changing old behaviors and thought patterns is difficult and often painful. This is the no pain, no gain myth. You gotta suffer, suffer, suffer first, and then you can change. Not so. Thought patterns and behaviors are caused by perception, beliefs, they're represented by specific configurations of photons of light, the energy we're talking about. Change the field, you change the belief. Change the belief and you change the behavior and thought pattern. So it's all about how do you isolate the belief you want to change, how do you get the subconscious mind to do the work for you instead of making it so hard trying to do it consciously. And we're going to be doing just that. Myth number three, you need to consciously know what caused the problem in order to change it. Well, if I don't know what caused it, how can I change it? That's the mantra of mainstream psychotherapy because they're having to change things by figuring out what it was, telling you what happened, giving you this powerful insight, and then making a huge assumption that insight is a sufficient condition to change. Now that's what really turned me around after I got out of graduate school because I was sitting down doing that really well with people. We got real clear about why they were screwed up. <laughs> they knew, I knew, but they were still screwed up. Unsatisfactory, unacceptable. You had to figure out a way to change that. How do you get to the behavior? Not just through this ton of awareness. I don't know about you, I'm up to my eyeballs in insights. Spiritual insights, psychological insights, all these insights. And then you've got to wonder, well, why does my life look like all these wonderful insights I've got? I mean, true. So the reason is we have been talking to the wrong part of the mind most of the time. So becoming consciously aware of the source of the problem is seldom necessary to change most beliefs or behaviors when you're dealing with the subconscious mind. That's where the power is, that's where the juice is, that's where the storage unit is for your beliefs. It's not about willpower. Okay, let me give you an overview of the, of the process that I use, and this is um, basically the components of it, think of it that way, uh, to get the job done in terms of speeding up change, and literally it can happen in just a few minutes. Establishing communication with the subconscious is step one. I was never taught that in graduate school. In fact, I don't think they mention the subconscious except talking about Freud. And Freud, I mean, if you listen to Freud, the subconscious is a place nobody wants to go. I mean, talk about a deep, dark abyss of, uh, you know, repressed sexual desire. And you know the term Freudian slip? You know what that is? That's when you say one thing, but you mean your mother? Yeah. That'd be a Freudian slip. Okay. So nobody wants to go there because they've made it a horrible place to go. But the fact is, it's no more horrible than your hard drive. You go to your hard drive all the time. If you open your computer and you get documents out of there and stuff, that's energy. So we're going to be communicating with the hard drive here. You're going to pre-test a desired belief statement. That's a very important thing to find out if your subconscious believes it or not. Like uh, Juliana was very kind to come up here and, and, and uh, give her attention to this process. And I had her say something that was pretty non-threatening. You know, my name is Juliana. But what if I had said something like, had her say something like, I love myself unconditionally, or I trust that I am a, a, a wonderful person, or anything that she would desire to be and to know about herself. Then all of a sudden the rubber meets the road. Now you're finding out from your subconscious mind, do you agree with that statement or do you not? You may have done tons of therapy, you may have been saying affirmations and meditated for 25 years, and I tell you, <laughs> surprise, surprise, you know, you'll say something you think is true and you do believe it consciously, but your subconscious mind never got the message. And that's the part that really needs to get it in order to have behavioral change last. That's why so much change tends to be temporary and, and made out of lots of willpower. All right, so we've got pretest the statement, get permission and commitment to change the belief using a psyche balance. The balance processes that I use, I call them balances because essentially what they do is, is they create a balanced identification or perception uh, of the left and right hemisphere of the brain at the same time for the new belief. And by doing that, using this whole brain integration process stuff, you can reduce the resistance to internalizing a new belief very quickly without all that effort and struggle. And the permission and commitment thing is really important. I, I've noticed in um, conferences I've attended uh, for energy psychology, as an example, uh, many of the processes make huge assumptions that if you have something that looks like it needs to be fixed, it actually represents something that's broken. I don't know about you, but a lot of times, whatever you call broken is a messenger. <laughs> you know, that message is there to, 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 that pain or difficulty or whatever you call dysfunction is there to teach you something, and you kill the messenger. So I found that it's much wiser to find out from the subconscious. It's even a good idea to do what you're talking about consciously before you do it. It saves you a lot of grief later on, and you don't have to get the proverbial two-by-four returning to get your attention because you managed to get a symptom to go away. This isn't about treating symptoms, it's about the cause of the symptoms.
And then we'll do a balance, which is a, a, the process for change using whole brain integration of some kind or another, different, different varieties of that. We'll post-test the belief statement because it gives you a physical muscle response that's going to be different than in the beginning. So you have an objective way to measure a subjective change. You don't just say, well, how do you feel? And, well, fine, you know, you look good. Uh, all right, see you next week. It's not that. You know before you leave the interaction whether that belief resides in your subconscious or not. So there's a way to know it for sure. And then celebrate the change, and that's my favorite part. So we'll be doing that. Okay. So, let's see. I want you to take a look at some of these messages. What I did was I distilled some of the key messages that over the years of doing psychotherapy, I found that many people internalize from their childhood. You'll never amount to anything. You're worthless. You're not smart enough. No matter how hard you try, it's never good enough. Money's hard to come by and hard to keep. You don't deserve to succeed. No one will ever love you. And Bruce's favorite, you're going to get cancer because it's genetic. <laughs> This one uh, at the bottom, of course, you can make uh, generic, which is uh, you're going to get whatever disease you're predisposed to because it, you, it's going to get passed along in your family. Uh, so it doesn't, it's, I'm, just, I'm just putting it out there to let you know that it doesn't matter what disease you put in this category of cancer, it's the same notion that I'm helpless and the situation is hopeless. I'm just going to get what I'm getting passed along. So these may be some of the messages that uh, you got. And the question is, what if you could change them? What if you could have anything on this list? What if anything on this list could be true for you? What I'm going to ask next is, I'm going to ask somebody else to come back up to the stage, and I'm going to facilitate a process, first of all, to discover whether the belief that seems desirable to you is currently true in your subconscious. And if it isn't, then I'm going to facilitate a process to make it so. It'll take just a few minutes to do that. And so what I'd like you to do is just read down this list and if one of these beliefs calls to you and just says boy I want that it may not be true right now I'm not sure but I'd be willing to come up here to make sure <laughs> would you let you have one okay come on up imagine if you had the privacy of your own home and one other person to work with and you didn't have an audience the whole time how simple the things are uh, it's just been remarkable uh, my experience in the change work when this work came in and I can say came in because I didn't sit down and, anal and, and, and analytically develop Psyche. It really was one of those born out of a moment of terrible frustration with graduate school training and other things I tried. All of a sudden, entire patterns of change were just downloaded in my computer. I went into my house, literally, and typed the information into a computer and said, OK, that's interesting. I wonder what that's about. And then I just read off the sheets and learned the work that way. It was very interesting. And this was 14 years ago. So I was very skeptical, didn't believe in muscle testing because I'd never experienced it, didn't believe in these patterns until I could experience them myself. And when I saw the really miraculous changes that were taking place in short periods of time, physically, emotionally, spiritually for people, I finally just said, okay, you know, thank you, and I'll do it. So it's, you find your path and you stay with it because it works. And it's my joy to get to share this information with you. It's like Bruce and I bond because he's bumping the, the envelope of biology. I'm doing the same with psychology. We've been looking in the wrong place for the changes for a lot of years. And it's time to wake up and do it completely differently. All right, so final thought. Remember that your beliefs determine the limits of what you can achieve. As Henry Ford put it, if you believe you can or if you believe you can't, you're right. <laughs> Good night.